In this video I wanted to talk to you guys about why I'm switching to the 40 caliber and it's really going to be a lot of uh, illustration with the chalkboard of death here. So uh, first thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, some of the little points that a lot of people make that don't mean anything to me and most people if you're actually strategizing how to afford being able to shoot in general. So I started out shooting 9mm and uh, the biggest thing for reloading was cost. And what I found was that the deviation between factory loaded ammo is huge as far as like the difference between the calibers because you're looking at like $10 a box that out of stores for a 9mm if it's a good deal on uh, stuff and then you know it can be cheaper if you're doing like aluminum or steel but um, 40 caliber you're looking at like $15 for a box out of the stores uh, <laughs> and of course you can get lower. Uh, so I've seen some deals where it's like $10 a box because it's on clearance uh, that I got when I started like the Glock test. I got like hundreds of rounds of Winchester Training Defend that was going for like $10 a box. It was beautiful. Uh, but anyways, you never really uh, get those prices so I had to snack some up while I could. So anyways, uh, cost for reloading 9mm and 40 it's basically the same. Uh, there is a little bit of a deviation in the cost as far as like how many... Uh, it's like the the difference is like a penny uh, or even a part of a penny uh, when it comes to reloading these two so uh, really the cost and especially since primers have gone down in price yes even with this uh, COVID-19 crap uh, cost is irrelevant now for me and then the next one is some people talk about like what James Yeager was talking about. He's not wrong, but there's something that he's not mentioning here, and that's maintenance. He talked about what, and I quote, the 40 caliber beats the shit out of out of guns. That's why they fall apart, or you know whatever. I can't really quote too much more than the beat the shit out of the gun part. He's right. It's higher pressure. But here's the funny thing: the pressure that the 40 caliber is putting on the guns is no different than a 9mm plus P, a higher range 9mm plus P that a lot of people like to, you know, use. So, it's kind of, you're kind of losing credibility using that as an excuse, in my opinion. So, here's what you do. You need to change your recoil springs when you're supposed to and, you know, talk to your manufacturer about that. And if they say, well, I don't, we don't have a time when to change recoil springs, then it's probably not a gun that you want to get because it wasn't made for the 40 caliber. Now, the Glock Gen 4, uh, they typically will have a set <coughs> round count that you'll want to change the recoil springs. Do that maybe a little bit earlier if you're shooting it really fast and being aggressive with your training. There's nothing wrong with that, but they're cheap components. It costs less than a box of ammo. So change your recoil springs. So and uh, change different springs out. Mostly the recoil spring is going to be the biggest part, right? And you the recoil spring will save the frame. It'll save save the slide and a lot of other uh, stuff as well. So just maintain your gun. It's not really going to be a problem. It'll last. Pretty much just as long as the 9mm version. And the biggest thing is get a gun that's made for the 40 caliber, right? So the next one um, is basically a big one for me. Recoil. Okay, so when I went from 9mm to 40, I was really surprised at how little recoil there was. Everybody talks about how this thing is just going to flip all over the place. I'm not going to be able to control it. But it seems like I'm one of the few, along with like Paul Harrell and a couple of others, that actually don't really notice much of a difference as far as like the ability to get shots back on target. It seems to be mostly hype. Like people won't actually get a good grip. What's essential to recoil control? Well, it's going to be grip and technique. It's not one or the other. It is actually both because technique actually comes almost... Okay, technique is basically like that body's timing on when to implement actual control because if you see people doing this on, on, a, on a round that doesn't go off, it's not necessarily that they're trying to throw the bullet out or they're anticipating. Yeah, they're anticipating, but they're trying to control the recoil mid-shot. That's why you'll see people like constantly leaning forward if they're shooting a lot of rounds. 
because you're leaning into the recoil to control it. That is not a bad thing. Any advanced shooter will actually know the difference between anticipating, which is basically doing this before you pull the trigger. There's a difference. Now, trying to put your recoil control before actually uh, pulling the trigger, that's that's anticipation. Doing it afterwards, that's just applying a technique of automatically getting the gun back on target, and you do kind of have to muscle it. You can't just have a limp grip and do it. With the 9mm, you can kind of get away with that, and that's why a lot of people like to stick with the 9mm, because they don't need to apply proper grip and technique as much as they do with things like 40 caliber or even 45. So, when people complain about this, it just means that they don't want to actually have to work on this, in my opinion. Because it seems like there's a lot of people that are just really... They say one thing, and they don't, they don't actually practice what they preach, right? So, you see that a lot with some instructors. You'll, they'll talk about how you need, to, you need to manage the recoil on that gun and own that gun. Okay, here's my 40. Go ahead and show me how it's done. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't know. And it's like... Okay, right. It doesn't really even have that much recoil, but just a little bit more than their little mouse fart loads, then they just can't control it. So I see a lot of hypocrisy in this. That's why these things aren't really issues to me, because I actually go out and I shoot my guns. So, now let's talk about the issues that I actually have with 9mm that I've found is easily corrected with the 40 caliber. Not necessarily the 45, but the 40 caliber. 9mm and the 45 actually do suffer from some of the same things. First things first is the one that I hate the most. And <clears throat> one of the biggest things that I actually saw in a lot of my testing deviation off the intended trajectory. Now, this could be called a couple of different words, but basically, let me go ahead and illustrate this really quick. So, your shot is right here. Say, when I was testing my ballistics gel, this is what you actually will see. If you actually look back on my ballistics gel, what you'll see is my shot was here. And what you thought was going to be the end impact, if it was going to its resting point, would be about here, right? Well, that's not exactly what ends up happening when you're shooting something that is light and fast. What ends up happening is you actually get something more along the lines of this, or this, or somewhere like this. And, and you see this with one of, the, one of the people's favorite rounds. The Extreme Penetrator actually does this. Now, yes, it does reliably get to 18 inches, but I'm more concerned about the location and the uh, deviation off the intended trajectory because if I'm aiming for the heart and it strikes a bone and it starts deviating off of that that's a big concern because even just testing in clear ballistics and it gets 18 inches what that tells me is in FBI gel it's going to get 15 inches instead of 18 because that's what clear ballistics has been proven to have a problem with is actually mimicking the penetration depth that you'll see in FBI gel, which is calibrated to their specifications, hence why the FBI isn't even using it. But the one thing that clear ballistics actually does pretty well is it shows the wounding cavity. And this brings us into the next part is basically, uh, I guess you could say, the overall damage. I mean, here's the thing. If... If everything's equal, you get the same, if you get a round that could reliably goes 18 inches and still expands at, in both the 9 and the 40 caliber, and it doesn't deviate off the intended trajectory, what you're losing is damage capability. Now, this is going to be dramatic for illustrative effect, but you get the 9mm, right? And then you get the 40. It's not much bigger, but it's big enough to actually notice it. And you'll notice it, especially like when you're picking up brass. It, it's not much bigger, but it actually uh, does get bigger when the bullets expand. There's actually a marked difference in the expansion because you'll get you'll get uh, some rounds for the nine millimeter that'll expand, you know, this big, and then you'll get the forty calibers in the same same class that are expanding that big. That little bit can actually make a difference in the amount of damage. So there was a there was Somebody who basically said, wisely, pick the biggest caliber that you can shoot uh, competently. And the problem I have with this is some people are like, well, 
how about you shoot a 45 because the 45's damage range is, you know, up here because you can get like an HST that will expand now to an inch. I got my own problems with the HST and that's just straight up over under penetration. So it'll basically get around here where you can get like a generic hollow point that costs like a third of the price of an HST that can actually get around here. So yeah. But anyways, yes it's consistent and everything and it's cute. It's good, probably good for animals but for human beings I'm there's a lot more that I'm concerned about, but this isn't part of the conversation. It's across the caliber board. But anyways, with 45, it still suffers from deviation. It's going slow, and it's it can be kind of heavy. And as soon as you're taking something that's already going slow and applying flaps on it, any kind of manipulation, it can be sensitive to that. So if you so for example, if you're looking at Lucky Gunner, you will actually see even with the compact uh, guns that he's using, or even the subcompacts, the shorter barrels, it still does have some deviation on it. Uh, the one way that you can kind of solve the deviation issue with 9mm is basically, you know, take the velocity down just a hair, and that's basically getting a shorter barrel. And that's why I say you need to be careful about the barrel length that you're putting certain weights in, and that's mostly velocity-based. So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is going to be barriers. Time to talk about barriers. So, this is a big problem for the 9mm. It's just physics. When you're propelling something too fast it, and you hit a hard medium, it's going to start in basically dramatizing the deviation, which we just talked about. Uh, there's some people that are like, well, the deviation wasn't all that bad off the intended trajectory with the, uh, uh, what was it, the extreme penetrator. Well, actually, yeah, it was. When it hit the gel afterwards, it actually did, you know, cause it to go off the intended trajectory a bit. So it still disrupted it. It took away, it may not have taken away the mass, but it did take away a lot of that momentum. So, you know, you got to account for that, and it can accelerate the uh, disruption that it has on the intended trajectory. So yes, the 9mm is susceptible to this. Now what I've found is typically in order to get the 9mm to work you need to find a balance. That means that you need to match the velocity, i.e. the barrel length, to the weight that you're shooting. So if you're going to take like a 115 and you're going to propel it out of a 5 inch barrel you're not gonna really going to get that good of results. It's basically going to try to tear itself apart. And it's going to be very susceptible to deviation off the intended trajectory once it gets into the body. Now the 124 out of a 5 inch barrel, it's going to have less deviation. So it's going to have a little less deviation. Now with the 147, see the heavier it is for the barrel length, you know, you're matching it and it's just going to be barely having any deviation. Almost unrecognizable, right? Well, that's because you're matching the bullet weight to the barrel size. See, if you're taking, let's say, you put this in a 3 inch barrel. And we just basically put all of these in a 3 inch barrel, right? What's going to happen here is the game is going to change a little bit. It's almost going to reverse itself, but not quite. What's basically going to happen is the 115 is going to start giving you a little bit of deviation, but not all that much. But then this one is pretty much going to streamline itself pretty well. And this one, typically going to do that. And that's because you're taking velocity away at 3 inches. But you can see how typically 9mm is really dependent on barrel length. Barrel length is the dictator of basically bullet performance when it comes to 9mm. And that comes through understanding things and having experience and testing things and actually doing your own damn research. Which people don't do and it frustrates the hell out of me. But people will just pick anything up in the store and they'll just say, just get this all the time. It always works. Does it? Does it really? Because even though it's going to penetrate kind of shallow, um, it still can do this if it hits bone. And that's not saying it's going to make an S inside the body. It's just 
symbolizing deviation off the intended trajectory. So anyways, this one will be more stable at 3 inches because it's basically getting where it wants to be as far as matching the velocity to the, uh, to the size. Now, the other factor is always going to be how much it expands. And this is basically your expansion right here. The little symbol for your expansion. How much it expands will also dictate this, this wave right here, the extreme of it. The more it expands, the more you're going to control how far it goes in, and the more you're going to manipulate its course through the target. So, barriers. Barriers. External or internal are a big player. That's depressing. But anyways, uh, so, anyway, that's why I uh, switched to 40 caliber. Barriers general deviation off the intended trajectory, bad juju. So you have to basically have a fine science in your head on how these things are going to perform and that comes from a lot of testing and I've tried to help a lot of people out on saying, you know, this is not good, this is this is bad or this is good, this is bad, you know, whatever. I've tried to do my part as far as like communicating that but I think that the chalkboard of death was the only thing that people were really going to listen to. So. I hope that was helpful, but anyways, that's why I switched from the 9mm to the 40 caliber. The 40 caliber just seems to do a lot better in all those aspects. And there's no real perfect round, but the 40 caliber sure does get close as far as, you know, what I'm expecting it to do. And that's basically going anywhere from 15 to 18 inches in some cases, or it's just easier to find a round that'll perform better in a 40 caliber and consistently better and be able to punch through those barriers and still perform. That's a big thing because we do have internal barriers in here. So anyways, let me know what you think in the comments below and you guys have a good one.